Dear friends of the European Reference Network on Rare Connective Tissue Diseases, my name is Vanessa Smith, Ghent University and Ghent University Hospital, Belgium, and it is my pleasure to speak to you on microcirculation and rheumatic diseases. In this lecture, more specifically, we will deal with capillaroscopy. In the next 20 minutes, we will deal with what is capillaroscopy, how do we, according to the European League Against Rheumatism study group on microcirculation and rheumatic diseases, standardly evaluate the morphology of the microcirculation? Thirdly, what is the major role of capillaroscopy? And then we will say something about capillaroscopy and lupus. Now let us start by saying what is capillaroscopy. Capillaroscopy is a safe and non-invasive tool to look at the morphology of the microcirculation. Ideally, we look to the nail fold of the morphology of the micro of, to the nail fold to the morphology of the microcirculation because this is the only place where capillaries run parallel to the skin surface, and consequently, you can see them in their longitudinal axis. As you can see on this slide, we have an operator sitting in front of a patient with a handheld device, also called a probe. The operator moves the probe to the nail fold of the patient and after focusing with a lens of 200 magnification, here you can see the operator is focusing, you can directly see the image on the screen of your PC. Usually we take four images in a patient, one lateral image, two medial image and one lateral image. Several tools can be used to evaluate the morphology of the microcirculation. On the left-hand side of this slide, you can see the dermatoscope, which is still used frequently in the United States. With this tool, you have a panoramic view of the nail fold. But you can less well evaluate the morphology of individual capillaries. It is less fitted than the video capillaroscope to definitely know whether there are abnormalities on your capillaroscopic image, but they are very cheap and that's why they are frequently used as a first line. On the right hand slide of this, on the right hand side of the slide you can see nail fold video capillaroscope which allows you to evaluate the individual capillaries as we will see later. This allows you to discern an abnormality and here you have a normal shaped capillary with the shape of a hairpin. There are a lot of characteristics that can be described when looking at a capillaroscopic image and hence different schools have used different terminologies which cause sometimes a Babylonic language barrier in interpretation between studies. Hence, with the earlier study group on microcirculation and rheumatic diseases, a consensus has been formed about what characteristics to standardly evaluate throughout all rheumatic and autoimmune diseases. This standard interpretation of capillaroscopic images will facilitate futurely comparison between published studies. As you can see on this slide, we always evaluate the number of capillaries per linear millimeter. This is also called density. A stereotype normal number is seven capillaries or more per linear millimeter. We always count the capillaries in the distal row and I will count here for you. Here you count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 capillaries. An easy rule of thumb is that you gouge the average length of the capillaries on your screen. You make a line on 90 degrees above this average length and then you count the distal row. On the right hand side of this image, you can only count five capillaries in the distal row. Here I count one, two, three, four, five capillaries. This image, as you will see later, belongs to a rare connective tissue disease that has a specific capillaroscopic change. More specifically, it belongs to a patient affected by systemic cirrhosis. Secondly, we always evaluate the dimension of a capillary. We usually measure the dimension apically. An apical diameter of less than 20 micrometers is stereotype normal. And we will see in a minute what are giants. Giants are capillaries with a normal shape, and on the next slide we will know what morphology is, with a normal shape or normal morphology with an apical diameter of 50 micrometers or more. These giant capillaries are specific for scleroderma spectrum diseases such as systemic cirrhosis. 
Thirdly, we always evaluate the single shapes or the morphology of capillaries. Per consensus and based on landmark studies such as the study of Andrade, the stereotype normal shapes are the hairpin shape, the tortuous shape, which means that the limes bend but they don't cross, or the crossing shape. Here you see, can see a capillary with crossing once. All the other shapes are called abnormal shapes. We have seen with the earlier study group on microcirculation and rheumatic diseases that categorizing a normal or abnormal shapes has the highest reliability when also adding the criterion of convexity of the tip of a capillary. Hence, in short, for a capillary to be called a normal shape or normal morphology, it must be hairpin, tortuous or crossing, and also it must have a convex tip. Of note, as we will see further on in the fast track algorithm that we will go over in minutes, the combination of a very diminished capillary density, as you can see in this image, because here I only see two capillaries combined with abnormal shapes, because in this image you see abnormal shapes, is also called a scleroderma pattern, more specifically a late scleroderma pattern. Lastly, we evaluate on the capillaroscopic images the bleedings or the hemorrhages. Now, what is the major role of capillaroscopy? The major role of capillaroscopy is placed in the Reynolds phenomenon. Reynolds phenomenon, as we all know, is a vasomotoric reaction against cold stimuli and stress and may be functional or primary, or it may be due to other causes. There are many reasons for a secondary notes phenomenon, but by and large, a secondary notes phenomenon is frequently caused by connective tissue diseases with systemic cirrhosis as the number one cause. Moreover, as you can see on this slide, and I do recommend to all of you to read this landmark paper by Kuhn and colleagues, which teaches us that if you have a patient sitting in front of you with a Reynolds phenomenon, but no sign of connective tissue disease, at baseline, then over time still a certain amount of them, more specifically 13.6%, will turn on to get a secondary notes phenomenon, with the largest proportion developing systemic cirrhosis. More specifically, 12.6% of the 13.6% will develop systemic cirrhosis. More specifically, as I just said, in a patient population with Reynolds phenomenon at baseline, but no sign of any connective tissue disease at baseline, 12.6% will develop systemic cirrhosis over time and only 1% will develop other connective tissue diseases such as, for example, lupus. The landmark study of Kunig is important as it shows to us that the combination of capillaroscopy and detection of systemic cirrhosis-specific antibodies can help us to discern already at baseline visit which patient with Reynolds phenomenon but no sign of connective tissue disease has a high chance to develop systemic cirrhosis over time and which patient is quite safe. More specifically, the study of Koenig presents us with an algorithm with high performance characteristics to predict who will get systemic cirrhosis and who will not. In this slide, you can see that if a patient as baseline has Reynolds phenomenon but no sign of connective tissue disease and a scleroderma pattern on capillaroscopy, and if this patient also has a systemic cirrhosis-specific antibody, that the chance is high to develop clinically overt systemic cirrhosis within five years. More specifically, the chance is 65.9% in five years. Very importantly, the positive predictive value of this algorithm is 79%, so almost 80%. This means that in 80% of cases where you predict that this patient will get systemic cirrhosis over time, that you are correct. Conversely, if a patient is sitting in front of you with a Reynolds phenomenon and no sign of a connective tissue disease, and if this patient has no scleroderma pattern, and we will learn in a minute with a fast track algorithm to discern scleroderma patterns from non scleroderma patterns, but if this patient has no scleroderma pattern nor a systemic cirrhosis specific antibody, then your chance is less than 5% to get the disease over a long time. More specifically, it's only 1.8% over 20 years. These patients can be reassured because this algorithm has a very high negative predictive value. 
of 93%. This means that in 93% of cases where you reassure this patient that you're correct to reassure this patient. Now, how do we interpret the study of Koenig? Well, based on the capillaroscopic characteristics, as we have learned earlier, you can find a sclerodama pattern on capillaroscopy in your patient who's affected by the Renaud's phenomenon, or you can not find a sclerodama pattern. If you don't find a sclerodama pattern and you don't have systemic cirrhosis specific antibodies, then your patient is quite safe. But for the untrained capillaroscopist, the evaluation of all possible combinations of the capillaroscopic characteristics described in this table is very challenging. Hence, the Euler study group on microcirculation in rheumatic diseases has made a fast-track algorithm to facilitate capillaroscopists of any level to safely classify an image as scleroderma pattern or not. And this algorithm is created by the Euler study group on, on microcirculation in rheumatic diseases and consists of three simple rules. If the capillaroscopist follows these rules, then the capillaroscopist of any level knows he adheres to the expert in calling an image scleroderma pattern or non-scleroderma pattern. This algorithm was tested in two renowned courses in between capillaroscopists of any levels, beginners, semi-trained and expert, and had a high interrater reliability, both at the Euler course on capillaroscopy in 2018, as well at the Euster course of 2019. You apply the algorithm as follows. Rule number one, if your density or your number of capillaries is seven or more, and if you have no giants, then for sure your image belongs to a category one or is a non-scleroderma pattern. And this is an example. Here I count more than seven capillaries and I have no giants. Rule number two, if your image contains giant capillaries, remember capillaries with an apical diameter of at least 50 micrometer and a normal shape or normal morphology, we've seen the definition for normal, or, and this is an image with giant capillaries, or if you have the combination of a very lower density, more specifically three or less capillaries combined with abnormal shapes, as you can see in this image, then you may safely call your image a scleroderma pattern. It belongs to category two. If you don't apply rule number one, or if your case doesn't apply to rule number two, then automatically you're directed to number, rule number three. And this is very simple. In all other cases, but rule number one or rule number two, you can call your image a category one or a non-scleroderma pattern. Let us, to end, move slowly to lupus and capillaroscopy. In this very nice systematic review published in autoimmunity reviews using the standard description of the Euler study group on microcirculation in rheumatic diseases and applying the standard table we just saw earlier, the following could be concluded. First, in lupus, concerning all the capillaroscopic characteristics we standardly evaluate, all these studies retained in this systematic review showed conclusive data attesting that more abnormal shapes are present in a lupus population than in a healthy population. So the prevalence of abnormal shapes in a lupus population is higher than in a healthy population. Secondly, concerning clinical applications of capillaroscopy in lupus, it has been conclusively tested in the systematic review that disease activity is associated with capillaroscopy. We are coming to an end of this presentation. We have learned about the role of capillaroscopy to evaluate microcirculation in rheumatic diseases and autoimmune diseases in a standardized way. More specifically, we have learned the standard description of capillaroscopic characteristics by the Euler study group on microcirculation in rheumatic diseases. We have learned what is the fast-track algorithm to discern a scleroderma pattern from a non-scleroderma pattern in the same way experts do. And lastly, we have seen a systematic review which has applied the standard description of capillaroscopic characteristics on a connective tissue disease, more specifically lupus. Thank you cordially for your attention. <laughs>